I don't mind you playing the race card if it's racist, if if you were fired because the color of your skin or whatever. But but let's be blunt. I mean, she was playing a card that nobody brought up. She has been the victim of racist attacks from people are trying to dox her and harass. I have no doubt there are some evil people trying to bring race. To, they're trying to bring race into it also. And so, unfortunately, she's using that to try to muddy the waters against these legitimate criticisms. And that's the problem. We are going to push through, make sure this window does not close, and push through in the 50 states and in, in the House, wherever we can, a rich policy agenda that gets rid of DEI, gets rid of gender theory, gets rid of collective hysteria we've had for the last three years over race and sex. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're heading into the weekend, but more than that, this is our 100th episode. Thank you for those who've been in the beginning. Thanks for those who kicked it off in 2024. We're excited to be with you. We have a great show today. Mike Gonzalez of the Heritage Foundation, Tim Graham of the Media Research Center, and Carrie Sheffield of the Independent Women's Forum are all joining us to break down what's happening at the border, what's happening, all the tension at the White House press briefing room. Ooh, so much to get into it. Let's welcome him in. Mike. Tim, Carrie, good to see you all uh, in 2024. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to start, um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mike, uh, on this Harvard Claudine Gay thing. I, I've been around a lot of crisis situations um, in in my 30 something years of doing PR and, and communications. This is the the story that won't die. Uh, I feel like Claudine Gay could have just gone away and it would have been over. And yet her allies, her self continue to perpetuate this. It has now become a a race issue as opposed to just a, hey, you screwed up a congressional testimony and then you copied a lot of stuff and plagiarized. Well, uh, she did all that. Uh, to me, her greatest uh, fault and the reason for her downfall is that was that she was a DEI champion. She wanted to turn Harvard into DEIU. As dean of the School of Social Sciences, she devoted a lot of attention to DEI. She got a Roland Fryer fired uh, because Roland Fryer, an eminent uh, social scientist and who's African American, I must add, had a, a an ironclad paper saying there was no bias in the lethal use of force no racial bias in the lethal use of force by police. And eventually they found a reason to fire him. So I think that's really, but, but, but uh, you know, her defense of herself in the New York Times yesterday, yes, she played the race card, which, which is just <laughs> really, nobody should ever play the race card, right? But I think more important is the other allegations that she made. Wait, wait, hold on. Just to, wait, real quick. I don't mind you playing the race card if it's racist, if if you were fired because the color of your skin or whatever. But but let's be blunt. I mean, so so the re, she was playing a card that nobody brought up. I mean, well, she, so she, she was accused point. of she was accused of of not calling out anti-Semitism and of plagiarism. Race didn't. And the only thing that race entered into this equation was was how she got hired. Well, she tried to muddy the water. So if you read her I, New York Times piece, she because she she has been the victim of racist attacks from people who are calling her the N word online. I'm sure they're trying to dox her and harass. I have no doubt there are some evil people trying to bring race. To, they're trying to bring race into it also. And so unfortunately, she's using that to try to muddy the waters against these legitimate criticisms. And that's the problem. It's like, OK, we can both condemn these evil people who are racist and attacking her, but they're totally separate from the legitimate reasons. Not to mention the the University of Pennsylvania president, who's a white woman, she was forced out also. So I don't I to me, it doesn't make sense for her to try to to say that was the right. that Claudine is trying to say this. The reason I was fired is because I'm black. Right. That's not, but, that's but, categorically but, false. She I would only take that her detractors were motivated by by racial animus. Her main detractors the three main protagonists were Chris Rufo, right. Aaron Siberium of the Free Beacon, who did fantastic work. So did Chris, obviously. And Bill Ackman, the billionaire donor. These are the three main protagonists. I followed them very, very closely. I saw zero racial animals. I, oh. Chris Rufo is a friend. He is not a racist. So that is really what I meant. Oh, I mean, no, no. I'm not I, I know, about, I know. I, I mean, I'm talking about the trolls, right. the anonymous trolls. Right, right, right. We know nothing about. 
I, I was just sort of having fun with the fact that like she sort of is injecting race into something that started <laughs> had nothing to do with race. Plagiarism as a all right, folks, are you looking to secure your financial future? I know I was, right? You've got real estate, maybe some stocks, a bunch of other things, a 401k, an IRA. But how are financial metals part of that? Because you look at the price of gold, the price of silver, so many of the other precious metals, how they've done over time, it's a smart bet. And the folks at Bishop Gold Group can sit down with you and talk to you about how to convert an IRA, a 401, whatever it is, just make it part of your planning. I did it. I sat down, I talked to them about what made sense for me. I got precious metals as part of my portfolio now. And here's the thing, you can keep them, they can keep them. You will sit down with the folks at Bishop Gold Group and come up with a plan that's right for you, depending on how much you have, what you want, where you wanna store it. Whenever you're ready to cash it in, you call them back and say, hey, here's what I have, I need to cash it out. They'll make that happen. That's the beauty. These are folks that I know, that I trust, that I talk to. So if you wanna join me, then go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. You get a special promotion for kicking off your journey to financial freedom uh, and diversification with Bishop Gold Group and Precious Metals. Or you can call 844-984-1616. But go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean to see how you can make Precious Metals part of your financial freedom journey. Thanks. Tim Graham, you guys over at the Media Research Center, Mike Gonzalez brought up Chris Rufo, the conservative activist that kind of brought a lot of this to bear. Number one, I mean, I don't even know where to start with the media piece of this because I feel like I could spend the rest of of our time together on this. But number one, uh, they didn't do their job, right? That's the number one thing. These folks in the media blamed conservative media for doing something. And I thought to myself, I tweeted this out. I go, you realize that you're exposing the fact that you, the folks in the legacy left-wing media, didn't do your job. There was this trove of plagiarism that you didn't call out and then you blamed conservative media. But Mike Gonzalez brought up Chris Rufo's name. And at one point, the Associated Press went after Chris Rufo and said that he used the word getting a scalp, right? It was, and, and, and everyone at the AP, the Associated Press went after him claiming that somehow he was invoking Native Americans and killing Native Americans. And it took Chris Rufo probably eight minutes to Google the Associated Press using the word getting a scalp in a headline that they had published. It's amazing. <laughs> like, I was like, you guys might want to use your own computers before you attack this guy. Plus, the, the practice of scalping originated here in North America in the 12th century, uh, it's estimated. It wasn't brought here by the white man uh, to say this. AP, which it, is, it used to be a venerable wire service institution, it's now been, been taken over by woke gnomes. It is really, it's, 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 it's disturbing to see what's happened to the Associated Press. Tim, Tim Graham, at the Media Research Center, I mean, you guys on your uh, Newsbusters twi- uh, Twitter X feed have really called out a lot of this stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it just doesn't end. Yeah, it starts with the hearing, right, where the three college presidents come up and they say, is it you mean okay? the trap. To- the trap. <laughs> yeah, they fell into a trap. That's what Claudine Gay said. And, and that was that uh-huh. if somebody says, I want all you Jews dead, is, is that free speech and uh, or is it something that should be curbed and they were like well it's in in, in context. context that's not hate speech or whatever she the weird weird answers they gave that was the start of the whole thing i will say this the networks covered that hearing just because they have been a little uh willing to cover anti-semitism as a topic since the slaughter on october 7 so so at least that put the story on the map what really happened here was at some point whether it's Christopher Rufo, Rufo running a vast right-wing conspiracy. The New York, po- the New York Times brought, got into the story and started investigating her plagiarism, the Washington Post. Uh, and when, once you get outlets like that covering it, like it's a real story, it's a little hard for them then to claim that somehow the right-wingers made this an issue. They may have started it, but they didn't finish it. Um, but as you suggest, just what the, the coverage since she was forced out has been the worst of it. And they've all wanted to try to say, well, there were claims of plagiarism. There were these allegations. uh, And Claudine Gay writes in the New York Times, you know, I didn't plagiarize. And it's like the New York Times found that you plagiarized. 
The last story Aram Severium did had massive chunks of plagiarism right there. Um, so for people to pretend like they don't really know whether it can be verified is, is yeah, that's bad journalism. Mike Gonzalez, let me ask you this. At the Heritage Foundation, you guys do a lot of academic research. You publish a lot of stuff. If, if there was an instance where uh, a fellow or an academic at the Heritage Foundation had multiple instances of not properly citing works, what would happen to that person? Well, we'd have to right away. I mean, you can you can make these errors uh, in, in, without any ill intention, right? And the, the, the thing to do is recognize it right away, correct the record, and apologize, um, which Claudine Gay did not do. Claudine Gay, she said in her New York Times piece that she corrected her record right away. That was an outright lie. She she had her lawyers try to intimidate the New York Post into not publishing the allegations of plagiarism. Um, so, so this is, by the way, I think journalism worked. Journalism worked. Aaron Siberium is a journalist. Chris Rufo is a journalist. The Washington Examiner, in which I am a weekly columnist, is a me, it's a, it's, it's a press medium. You know, Tim, what, what Tim does in, 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 in media research, that is journalism. I think that we have to stop thinking that journalism means the mainstream media and CNN. What Fox and the New York Post is doing is journalism. And in fact, we're making them better. We're pushing them. One thing we have seen this on the border. The, me the mainstream media can no longer ignore the border, can no longer say that they it has to show that the border has been erased, that the border has been overrun. And that is to the credit of conservative media, which spent about a year and a half getting the ball rolling. But Kerry Sheffield, the thing that I find interesting about Mike's point is he's right. I mean, in, in some, and Tim brought this up, once the issue was put into the, the ball was in play, if you will. The Washington Post and others couldn't ignore it. But but if this was, if the shoe was on the other foot, right? I keep thinking to myself, when Donald Trump made those comments about Charlottesville and said, you know, there were good people on both sides and, and they completely took what he was saying out of context in terms of what he meant. He had already denounced uh, white supremacy and all this stuff. They didn't add any context. They didn't do anything. But in this case, what they might not be guilty of is at some point ignoring whether it's Claudine Gay or the border. But they didn't initiate this, 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 these reports or this journalism. They, they ultimately almost got guilted into covering it, Carrie. They did. Well, it, and it goes to a much bigger macro problem of the fact that now uh, Syracuse University just released this study showing 3.4% percent of American journalists are Republicans today. Yep. And they've been tracing this now for more than 50 years. You think that's high? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's true. It, it's probably a little inflated perhaps, but 3.4% today compared to 1971, 50 year, more than 50 years ago, it was uh, 25 or 25.7, almost 26%. So this huge drop Whereas the Democrats, it's actually been pretty steady around 35, 36% over the last 50 years. So to see this precipitous drop in the number of journalists who identify as Republican, this is why we see it's, it's both a sin of omission and a sin of commission. What are you failing to cover? That's the sin of omission. And then how are you botched and horribly covering things, the sins of commission? Um, that's really what we see. And then the problem it speaks more broadly. That, uh, the New York Times, to their credit, did run a great column by Ross Douthit on the Claudine Gay issue. And he pointed out some polling data on the overall perception of the academy and universities. So as, as recent as the Obama administration in 2012, a majority of Republicans actually said that the university system was a net positive for society. That has now shrunk to about 19%. And in a very short period, and it is in large part to all of the things that Mike does a great job of exposing, which is the, the pro proliferation of Marxism on campus, the, the, uh, the widespread acceptance of critical theory, which is a garbage theory that wants to dismantle, that's wants to dismantle the university system that was at least the way it was originally created. Um, and so it is uh, self-destructive um, to to, to, for the West to have created this 
this wonderful university system only to allow this disease of critical theory, because that's what really this anti-Semitism is. The root of the anti-Semitism is rooted in critical theory, which has to do with, you know, otherizing people based on race and, and you know, suppressors and, and all that stuff. All right, guys, let me ask you a question. Are you tired of testosterone boosting products that don't work? I get it. I don't blame you. That's why our sponsor, Nugenics Total T, has an idea for you. Why don't you try it before you buy it? What a great idea. If you text 231-231 and enter the word Spicer, you will get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total Tea. Uh, it's got testophen in it, which will help you turn back the clock and become that old you, that younger you, the vibrant you that you remember that guy. Well, that's what it'll help you do. Uh, and if it works for you, great, keep going. If it doesn't, you lost nothing. You get a complimentary bottle by texting 231-231, entering keyword Spicer. You're gonna get back that energy, that muscle, that drive, that passion that you used to have. And remember, this is the number one doctor-recommended brand, and the number one selling testosterone booster product at both GNC and at Walmart. They're on to something, right? People know what's happening here. But because you watch this show, you can get that complimentary bottle by texting 231-231. Enter code word Spicer. And if you do this right now, you get a complimentary bottle of Nugenics Total T uh, as well as the Nugenics Thermo X. Now, this is their newest and most powerful fat incinerator ever. It's got key ingredients to help get rid of that stubborn fat. And you know what I'm talking about. This is New Year's week. We've had been eating a lot of stuff. You need to get to this, right? Uh, so if you do that, you get both of these right now. Uh, this complimentary bottle, text 231-231, enter keyword Spicer. Now remember, uh, texting enrolls you into recurring automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. It is the number one doctor-recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. So before I get off the Claudine Gay thing, and I, I want to go around the horn and just kind of get some final thoughts. But but Mike, you brought up Bill Ackman. He is this Harvard graduate, very successful uh, uh, hedge fund manager that that is Jewish that went, I mean, he, if you haven't followed Bill Ackman, you're absolutely right. He was a leader in this movement, but his writing on it and his analysis of it on X has been just so profound. Um, and, and so I would encourage everyone to go to his, his Twitter feed, his X feed and read some of this. But I want to ask you guys this because he is sort of, continued, he wants to continue to see this this issue move forward, meaning that it's not just about clutting gay, it's will this DEI issue continue to permeate college campuses, specifically at Harvard, which is where he cares, but I think, you know, overall is the bigger point here. He wants to see the next president of Harvard uh, sort of have to denounce this and, and go through a process that's much different so that it's not DEI focused, which is where he thinks the problem started with. So let me kind of just go around real quick. Start with you, Tim Graham. Is this, is, is Claudine Gay sort of the end of the story or will there actually be any substantive changes on college campuses, Harvard and otherwise going forward after this? Well, I would not be optimistic. Right. I think the liberals reaction to this is fine. You knocked off one leftist, we'll put in another leftist. Uh, obviously, the next time they're going to have to find somebody with a little more sterling of an academic record. That's the. You that's mean they, the, they like have to have graduated from somewhere? They, or? They, they actually have to have written stuff that was theirs, and uh, uh, and so I, I think the issue remains. I think what was interesting was this that Ackman came at this as a funder. Right. That's that that had as much power or more power than the media for these funders to say we're we're going to walk with our money. Yeah, let's be clear. I think that was the reason the first, you know, head to fall was the president of, of Penn and then Harvard. I actually think that you you've touched on something, which is the real the real impetus for a lot of this is that these folks on the board of both Penn and then Harvard realized that money was at stake. This was their, th that was the, I mean, that's what really mattered to them was that donors were saying, I'm withdrawing funding. And that's what really did this, this idea that it was this altruistic idea that we recognized that we made a mistake, that she's not the right candidate is ridiculous. They knew something was at stake. Mike Gonzalez, this is your wheelhouse uh, over at the Heritage Foundation. Do you think that anything more than Claudine Gay's, uh, by the way, let's just also throw this out there so the audience understands this. She's not like getting you know thrown to the curb here. She is still getting a multiple, multiple 
hundred thousand dollar salary as a faculty member. Uh, you know, now that she has had to step down as president, so no tears there for Claudine Gay. But will this result in anything more than than just the next person stepping up to the plate? Yeah, it's it's nine hundred thousand dollars, but I'm okay with Harvard wasting its money. Nine hundred grand. To this teach morning, your uh, in, in, on the WSJ, on the Wall Street Journal's website, the leading story quotes me saying that the, a window of opportunity has opened, and conservatives are going to use it to push forward a robust policy agenda. The window of opportunity does not open with Claudine Gay. It kind of opened in mid year with uh, with the, the, the Students for Fair Admissions. Uh, uh, decision by the Supreme Court. And then it really was thrown open by the reaction to the October 7th massacre when students began to embrace the terrorists and began to oppose the women they actually gang raped because they thought that the latter were oppressors and the terrorists were oppressed. And people began to see, oh my God, what have we been doing by teaching students to look at everything through the oppressed oppressor narratives? That has opened the window. And I say this in that Wall Street Journal article which is being widely read, that we are going to push through, make sure this window does not close, and push through in the 50 states and in, in the House, wherever we can, in the, in the presidential debate, a rich policy agenda that gets rid of DEI, gets rid of gender theory, gets rid of the obsession, the, 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 the collective hysteria we've had for the last three years over race and sex. So yes, I'm optimistic. So, Carrie, taking off of what Mike said, just to I want to get your your points in on this. But there's a story that came out in the last 24 hours that's saying a lot of these college campuses, in fact, some corporations are ditching DEI, diversity, equity and inclusion. But they're just going to call it something different. They're going to call it like employee wellness or something, which is the same thing. It's just that they don't want to use a term that is now sort of been dragged through the mud. Yeah, yeah, and it's the same with ESG that they want to get a, right. get away from the you know environmental social governance lens, but but basically repackage it and put lipstick on a pig again. But um, I think as far as yeah, I, I think there are ways, there are mechanisms, and you you called it that money talks. Um, and I think uh, to Mike's point on having optimism, I did an event earlier. Well, actually, last year, 2023, can't say that this year, um, uh, with uh, Governor DeSantis down in Florida, I think he's given a good model there as far as using the power of the state for the state universities, which are you know massively powerful in the states, um, where conservative governors or just anybody, anybody of goodwill who's a governor in a governor's mansion and in the legislatures, they have a lot of power over the public university system, and then for the donors over the private, and then also federally too, if, if, if a conservative gets in the White House, they can put a lot of uh, purse string requirements on these private universities that are getting federal dollars. Uh, as far as, in, in my view, the, the racism that they are tolerating and encouraging, um, I think it's in, in violation of the constitution. I don't think they should be allowed to get any federal funding um, by encouraging racism and sexism um, and the abuse of women through the transgenderism. Um, that should be illegal as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then I will say, Mike, I, I slightly resent that you're okay with Harvard wasting their money as a Harvard grad myself. Um, I <laughs> really, uh, do not give to them anymore. I did give, unfortunately, the first couple years after I graduated. But uh, I have a policy now that instead of giving to them, I give to an outside group called the Harvard Christian Alumni Association in hopes that they can bring some light into a very dark place. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear they say that. I haven't given money to my college in years. Uh, not that it ever came close to equaling nine hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> I don't think it, it probably didn't hit nine hundred dollars. To be clear, uh, but I do think that that's one area, and it frustrates the heck out of me when I talk to alums who say, "Oh, I hate what the school is doing." And by the way, I just sent them, you know, a thousand dollars. I'm like, "You're encouraging that. If you don't like what they're doing." Stop funding it. Tim, um, I, I do want to switch gears, though, and talk to you a little bit about uh, what's happened down at the border. Uh, we, we talk about forcing the media to cover stuff. Speaker Mike Johnson led this 60-plus member delegation down at the border. It's those trips that are forcing the media. And the thing that I thought was so amazing about this particular trip is that these members are down there in Eagle Pass, Texas watching, uh, you know, talking to the press about what they're seeing and their policies and how they're going to address funding, et cetera, et cetera. And there are literally illegals coming over the border at the time. One guy handing a New York ID card through the, 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 whatever you want to call it, the fence 
Uh, I mean, it, it's just it's that blatant that that it's not even hidden anymore. The media had to cover that. Um, how did the media do vis-a-vis this particular trip and exposing what's happening at the border as far as the Media Research Center saw? Well, most of what we've seen during this administration is them ignoring the border, yeah. um, despite the historic amount of, of illegal immigration. The word illegal has vanished. Uh, the notion of what our immigration policy should be seems to sound like we need to be an efficient processor of migrants to make sure they get fed and housed and get some jobs. Uh, there's no notion of restricting immigration. That's what seems yes. to be missing. Right. Um, it seems like all the money they keep talking about, we need to get more people to process these people as opposed to preventing them, stopping them. Right. Is because apparently that's racist. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, look. Obviously, uh, they all hate Greg Abbott uh, because Greg Abbott has sent the migrants to blue cities that proclaim themselves sanctuary cities. And the media will not remind you that they said, we are basically the Statue of Liberty, send us all your, sanct you know, we're sanctuary city. They, you know, now they're all, stop, stop, Greg Abbott's a menace. He's sowing the seeds of chaos, you know, it, so... Uh, they're they're reporting it, but they're reporting it in sort of the classic, gosh, it's going okay. Jake Tapper yesterday, after a a reasonable interview with Mike Johnson, with the with the immigrants walking past behind Mike Johnson, <laughs> uh, then turned to uh, uh, to Kate Bedingfield, the Biden spinner, and was like, "Well, I know the White House said, you know, they've they've really been on the conservative side of things on this more than other democratic presidents in modern times. And it's just like, do you hear yourself? Well, there is, the, I thought it was interesting nothing, about that. It, the interview that, 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 that Tapper did with, with Mike Johnson is Mike Johnson's bringing up the, the terrorist uh, threats that are coming through, right? The number of people on the terrorist watch list that have entered the country. And Jake Tapper immediately tries to play that down. It says, but it happened in both Republican and Democratic administration. That may be true that some people have come through, but there's an exponential number of people that have come through that present a clear and present danger to our country that they are on the terrorist watch list. And Tapper's immediate reaction is to run to the defense of the Democrats and say, but it happens on both sides. And look, the Biden line on all of this is to say, we've had a broken system for 30 years. Can you imagine, though, that the, the Trump would have never gotten away with it? We get a, we, we've had a broken deficit for so many years. It's your you're the president of the United States. The thing that's interesting, Mike Gonzalez, is uh, the White House has had this talking point about how the, the Republicans have cut border patrol agents and da, 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 da. And I kept thinking, number one, I go back to the point that I just made with Tim Graham which is, yeah, but you guys don't want them to stop. You don't want additional resources to stop Im illegal immigration. You want them to process people in, more judges, more asylum uh, courts, et cetera. But Raj Shah, the, the head of communications for Speaker Mike Johnson, put out a memo that's out this morning that says that the White House has begun to spin its disastrous record on the Southwest border by falsely claiming Republicans had an anti-border security record and attempted to cut border and protection personnel. Specifically, they claim the House voted to eliminate over 2,000 Border Patrol agents in a road our capacity to seize fentanyl early in 2023. Here's the kicker that Raj Shah points out in this memo. There was never a vote. There was never a single vote. In fact, the, the liberal fact checkers have rated it both false and mostly false at PolitiFact. The reality is, and the media has completely ignored the fact that there was never actually a vote on this. You know, I don't think that this is going to have any impact whatsoever on the American people. I think the American people are now, everybody knows that we don't have a southern border. No, that it, it, my my colleague Laura Rees, who tracks these issues, estimated estimates that about ten million, over ten million people, have come in illegally since Biden has been president. In three years, that is the population of of, of we don't have that many states that have ten million people. Um, you know, it, 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 it's three percent of the population that existed here when Biden came to office 
and decided that, no, we don't need no stinking border. So I think that this is something that is unfixable. It's like the Afghan pullout. I think they, 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 the impression is there, and it's a, the right impression, that Biden decided for reasons that we don't really yet understand that we, he was going to throw open the border and allow anybody to come in. And it's, it's people from, from places that are on the terror list. Uh, I was, uh, I was in, in the Rio Grande Valley up there less than a year ago, and they were pointed out to me where they caught 100 Chinese immigrants, illegal immigrants. I talked to a businessman, I talked to him in Spanish, who told me that he had just spoken to 10 Russians who came in per speaking perfect Spanish because they had learned it in Venezuela, where there's a Russian, uh, they, where Russians are based. And they came in and they were talking to him. 10 Russians speaking perfect Spanish had just come in through the border. I, are these people, do, do, do they mean as well? I don't think so. All right, folks, longtime listeners to the show are going to know about Delta Rescue. DeltaRescue.org, the largest no-kill sanctuary in the world. It was founded by my friend, Leo Grillo. And Leo basically one day found a Doberman that was in need of serious help and nutrition. He rescued that Doberman. He named the Doberman Delta. Delta stands for dedication and everlasting love to animals. It's become Leo's mission. And what Delta Rescue does every single day for all sorts of animals. Go to deltarescue.org. Take a look at the videos and the material there. They rely solely on our contributions. If you're an animal lover, go check out deltarescue.org and tell me that you just can't see how what great work they do and why we should be helping them. Um, I've rescued three dogs myself. I know what it's like uh, to go out there and help them. This is a no-kill sanctuary for life. It's a mission for them. And they rely solely on our contributions. So five, 10, 100 bucks, whatever you can give, is super helpful. But more importantly, Leo wants to make this an enduring cause, something that we don't have to worry about just funding month to month, year to year, forever, to make sure that the work of Delta Rescue lives on. They've got an estate planning package on their website, deltarescue.org. Aside from the videos and all the testimonials, go check out that estate planning guide and see if you can make it part of your enduring mission when you pass to make Delta Rescue part of your estate planning. Check it out, download it. It's all free. They can help you walk through it. Please visit deltarescue.org. If you're an animal lover like me, you're going to want to do this. Thank you. To your point though, I, I, have a very, I don't have a cynical, I think I have a very pragmatic view of this, which is I have maintained that if you wanted to stop people from coming in, there are certain policies that you could easily institute. You could be working more with the with the Mexican government, the Remain in Mexico policies, among others, as far as where you file your first uh, claim of asylum. But the reality is the Biden administration doesn't want to stop this. They want these people coming in. And that's the reality. I don't think that there's any logical explanation otherwise that they that they are trying to stop this. They want these people in, they want them to get DACA, and then five, 10 years from now, they're gonna claim that they have a right to vote and a right to citizenship. This is a plan, and I think the longer that we fail to fully acknowledge that plan, we, we will deal with the consequences. But I, I, I firmly believe that there's no other explanation uh, why this happens. But Carrie, the thing that I, I, I can't believe is that the, the Republicans, I finally felt, had, had a degree of, uni, uh, of unanimous thinking on this at that press conference, that they need to take a stand. We had Chip Roy on the show just yesterday talking about the fact that this is their time to say, we control the purse strings. We need to make sure that we, we're making it clear that no funding until that southern border is closed. And this should be something I don't think that any Republican should object to. I 100% agree. Look, we just hit $34 trillion in debt. I mean, that is abhorrent as far as the, the trajectory of our country. And that's, that's, that's actually the low end of compared to where things are going to accelerate. Um, just from our interest payments alone, the interest payments alone are going to be soon crowding out like numerous other expenditures for things that we need just to pay the interest. So it's, uh, and to your point, Sean, yes, this, this is a complete chaotic, immigration policy. And for our Canadian and our European friends who love to claim moral superiority to us, if you look at a, a lot of their immigration policies, the American media would call those policies xenophobic 
um, I would call them rational and actually uh, more based on what is additive to our country. I, I'm very pro-immigration, but I'm pro-legal Legal. immigration. And it's got to be focused and smart, and it's got to be additive to the country and not detractive. And the National Academy of Sciences did an analysis of the use of public funds, and they found that families with children who were uh, immigrant versus non-immigrant, the immigrants were way more likely to use public services. That's just a fact. So when you have this enormous debt load and you have this ticking time bomb of the interest payments and the social security and the quote unquote entitlements of, of Medicaid and Medicare, it, it doesn't add up. And so you can't pile that on top of all this illegal immigration. Uh, one thing I like to point out when people say, well, well, Carrie, aren't you the child of immigrants or the, you know, the unset, the descendant of immigrants? It's like, yeah, yeah, I am. Although I am, I will point out almost 4% Native American thanks to my Utah Mormon ancestry. So I do have that. <laughs> but um, overall, I am mostly European descent. But the difference between when my ancestors came over, a lot of them came over from joining the Mormon church in the 1830s and 40s. Well, guess what? Back then, and also during the Ellis Island peak, we didn't have a social safety net. So that so the, what Milton Friedman said was, you can either have a social safety net uh, with borders or no borders and no social safety net, but you can't have both. And that's really the difference between today versus back then. These massive programs of the Great Society, et cetera, those, be, those happened later in the modern era before the massive swells of immigration coming over from Europe. We're in a different society now. We have $34 trillion of debt. Yeah. We didn't have that when my ancestors came over. That's right. Tim, uh, there's a lot of talk this morning uh, that the House will take action next week, specifically right now they're saying Wednesday, to, to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the Secretary of, of Homeland Security. Uh, I, I've, I, I talked to Chip Roy about this. I, I, I was of mixed feelings for a while thinking, okay, they're just going to replace him with the next guy. Uh, that will continue to implement. And first of all, I don't think the Senate will act anyway, but there is a stain about being impeached. And I've started to really come to the conclusion that that it's a moral imperative, that if we don't actually show that this is not acceptable behavior, what he is allowing to do, how he's not doing his job, he's kicking the can down the road, uh, at, at the very least, that, that that is a dereliction of duty uh, of House Republicans. Do you think that they will be successful in this effort? And how do you think this is going to play out in terms of what you guys at the Media Research Center look at? Will the media cover this in a fair way? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's start with the PBS NewsHour uh, on Thursday night where Amna Nawaz uh, uh, did an interview with Mayorkas that went on for nine minutes. And at the end, her last question was like, I suppose I'm, I need to ask about this impeachment. Uh, and, you know, she was disgusted that it was happening. And that was basically the, the question. Obviously, you would want to say, I have a, I, Mayorkas is coming in for an interview. Wouldn't you think that was the urgent number one question? Right. And the answer is no, because when, the, when Nancy Pelosi does an investigation or an impeachment, we cover the hearings live. We give them wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We yell at Fox if they don't give it wall-to-wall -wall live coverage. And when the House Republicans investigate Hunter Biden, when the House Republicans uh, impeach Mayorkas, this is all seen as partisan garbage. And we are not going to dignify it by covering it. Or if we cover it, we're basically going to say, Secretary Mayorkas, please denounce this. Um, that That's, I mean, I, let's be cynical, but that is our... Uh, you know, decades and decades, uh, you know, the, if they show it live, it's a Democrat hearing. Right. So Mike Gonzalez, you were mentioning you were down there, you've been on the border. If you were advising House Republicans about how to make the case to get a little bit more credibility with the mainstream media, as far as the impeachment of Alejandro Mayorkas, what would you, what would you suggest? Well, first, I want to say that I've known Carrie for many years, and I didn't know she had so much in common with Elizabeth Warren, Harvard and Native American. <laughs> no, she has a lot more than Elizabeth Warren, apparently. <laughs> I have, I have like, like four hundred thousand percent more than Elizabeth. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, look, I and she's I probably think... never used it to get a job either. <laughs> I did not use it to get into Harvard either. <laughs> so, I, 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 I look. I think that the case is open and shut. What has happened at the border has been disgraceful. Yeah. A country needs a border. 10 million people 
have come in because for, for reasons that perhaps have to do with what you said, Sean, that they think they want new voters. By the way, Biden is upside down with Hispanic voters right now. He's losing to Trump by 5% of points. I know. That's uh, crazy. You, you know, uh, crazy. Mitt Romney um, got 27% um, uh, in 2012. Trump is getting like 15% more. So for 50 percentage points more. So, but it, it, it may be other reasons, you know, these Democrats and people like Kamala Harris may not believe in borders. Yeah. Or, or they may believe that the people coming in belong to the oppressed category and we're the oppressors. Who knows? Or maybe it's because Trump closed the border and everything Trump did was bad. So we have to do the, the opposite of what Trump did. So let's open the border. For whatever reason, it is a disgrace. It is, it is treasonous. We are a country or not, and, and, and if we're going to self-govern, we need borders. Yeah. Kerry, I want to I wanna pivot to a story near and dear to my heart <laughs> that Axios finally covered. I was waiting. I've been waiting for this story, and I've been wondering why the press has been ignoring it. I'll get Tim Graham from the Media Research Center in a second, but I want to start with you. There's a story out in Axios this morning. It says the White House is tense podium battle. And let me read you the, the opening. It says, they share a podium and a mutual frustration. White House Press Secretary Kron Jean-Pierre and the National Security Council's John Kirby frequently split the podium at media briefings, but behind the scenes, their relationship is fraught with tension, White House sources tell Axios. And it basically says that from the jump, when Jen Psaki stood down, they were like, okay, we need to basically appoint Corinne Jean-Pierre. She was the principal deputy, although she has no experience in dealing with the press and she's not qualified, but we can't appoint John Kirby because he's a white guy uh, that uh, it doesn't check any of the boxes. But they basically, I mean, this story is insane because they talk about Kirby, a Biden favorite who's become the public face of the administration's response to the Israel-Hamas war. Um Basically, he's doing all these co-briefings with her. She makes it sure that she calls out the question, but Biden is now taking private briefings from Kirby. The fact that when she got announced, they needed to create a position for Kirby at the National Security Council, even though he doesn't report to the National Security Council. This was all finessed so that they could say that she was the press secretary, but they basically had a co-press secretary standing next to her as as sort of her babysitter. No, it, it, this is this is DEI in the workplace and the fruit of it because you have someone who is a retired Navy admiral, Kirby, who is impeccably credentialed in terms of his resume and his actual substantive, especially on this issue of Israel, um, with national security. So of course he is the more qualified individual, and he is the person who should be articulating the administration's response. And yet somehow, Corrine is like the Claudine Gay of the White House. And so this is this is the problem when you put uh, identity ahead of qualifications. And what's really sad is, I mean, I, I guess the possibly the only silver lining is this is, it, it just, it is illustrative to everybody to say this is this is the fruit of this behavior. Um, the problem is more substantively, if this is happening within our national security apparatus, that is actually a security risk from my perspective. If, you know, Tim, I, I was joking about why that I, I love this story, but the fact of the matter is even this story – fails to acknowledge something that Carrie touched on that, I mean, she's not qualified and the press knows it. The press doesn't get their answers to their lame questions. Uh, she doesn't know how to, she has no clear access to the president or any power center to read out situations. This is as close as you're going to get to them saying she's not qualified to the job. Uh, obviously the fact that Kirby is almost always there. I believe that this Alex Thompson story, he said they were like, 33 briefings and he was she only did one by herself and it was a gaggle which of course is not on television a gaggle on the plane it uh, was the only time Kirby wasn't next to her or Jake Sullivan wasn't next to her right so it clearly suggests that at least on foreign policy she ain't equipped oh no no look let's stop dancing around the issues she's not equipped on like lunch orders. I mean, she doesn't know <laughs> anything. And I think that we're, we're like, we don't need to dance around anything. The press knows it. Everyone knows it. Uh, and I can't believe, like I said, this is at least they're acknowledging the fact 
I mean, it says that he's basically telling people, yes, I'd like the job. Just give it to me. Send me in, coach. I can't believe that they have not sent her off to some other job and found a soft landing for because uh, they've checked the box already. Uh, unfortunately, though, that that ends us. We, we are out of time. Mike Gonzalez from the Heritage Foundation, Carrie Sheffield, the Independent Women's Forum. Uh, both of you, by the way, congratulations. I meant to mention both of you have books coming out on the same day. Mike, quickly, what's, what's the name of your book? Next Gen Marxism with Catherine Gorka. She's the co-author. Yeah, our good friend, Seb Gorka's amazing wife, Catherine. Uh, Carrie, your book? I've got a gallery right here, Motorhome Prophecies. Uh, it's a memoir about how I uh, had a very traumatizing religious upbringing, walked away from God and came back. And wow. I believe our society needs God. So, All right. Well, it's in March. And then Tim Graham, you need to go write a book. That's what my assignment for 2024 <laughs> is. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I appreciate you all tuning in to The Sean Spicer Show. Uh, we will see you back here tomorrow. Continue to subscribe on YouTube. Give us a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify. Feel free to text me. Join our VIP club, seanspicershow.com slash VIP. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.